Hi, I'm Jimmy. Hi, I'm Mikey. Welcome to our uh, demonstration of our, you know, va our valuation tool. Discounted cash flow. Discounted cash flow being the, yeah, you know, the star of the show. Uh, what else we got going on here, Jim? Why don't, why don't you show? Um, go over the chart and let us know what we're looking at for each stock we throw up here. All right, so I'm going to show you the tool in general. Uh, by the way, if you want to sign up for this tool, we will leave a link in the description below for how to sign up. But basically, here's the important numbers to look at if you're uh, if you're looking for uh, how to value a stock. Now, by the way, just so everybody knows, generally, big companies that have steady free cash flow, free cash flow can be somewhat predictable. You know, a company like Tesla, this wouldn't work as well on. There's better valuation methods. Uh, banks, there's better valuation methods than discounted cash flow. Although some banks have already been requested and we will do those because we get charts for ways we could try to come up with some fair value. So as far as the discounted cash flow calculator is concerned, here's the important part. I'm using a 7.5% required rate of return. That's what this is up here, this box up here. This gives us the fair value. Uh, we could see we got Adobe. Somebody requested Adobe already on the... Uh, Chat. on the chat so if you guys throw in some tickers in there mikey's keeping track of the tickers for us Drown him down. and uh this is the current price this is the fair value so adobe's actually heading in the right direction the other important number that i think is very good is to use if you're not sure what to use i'm using seven and a half percent but a lot of people don't like that if you're not sure what to use the company's weighted average cost of capital that's what this is here Companies' weighted average cost of capital can be a good number to use. It varies from company to company, and it does change over time based on interest rates, volatility, debt, things like that. But we could see with the case of Adobe, they have a 9.1% cost of capital. And if we use that to come up with a fair value, well, we get a fair value of 308 bucks per share. And because that's a higher cost of capital, in theory, you got to pay a low price, which is why that number is lower. Some other important numbers, now we'll jump into all the tickers here. Some other important numbers are the number of analysts. So in theory, we're going out the next three years. Uh, by the way, this tool I'm using the next three years. That you, you sh we should be able to find that easily for most big companies. But it is a bit conservative because we can see we're growing 10%, 18%, 13%. And then after that, it drops off to our perpetual growth rate which is in our case is two and a half percent. So these are a bit conservative. On the website, which should be up and running by the end of the second quarter of this year, that's where this tool is going to be. So if you come sign up, it will be on the website. We're gonna be able to extend this going out 10 years. So even if we only have analyst estimates for two or one or two or three years or no analyst estimates, well, I, I'm coming up with formulas for how to project out in a linear fashion, you know, free cash flow going out the few more years, which will make it less conservative. So in theory, these numbers would be a little bit higher. 406, less conservative, probably be around 430 range, just, you know, looking at their growth rate. So the number of analysts is important because in theory, if there's just one analyst, how reliable is that? If you've got 17, 15, you know, people sometimes ask me, are the number of anal are analysts even reliable? Well, if you ever turn on the news or... Uh, some company uh, where, you know, business station, and they say, oh my God, XYZ company missed earnings by three cents per share. It was analyst estimates that came up with whatever the number was. So analyst estimates tend to be fairly good. I do not trust analyst price targets. That's different. I don't trust that. But I do trust their, their estimates. They put a ton of time into those. So these are the free cash flow numbers. And yeah, that's pretty much it. If you want to, again, you want to sign up, link in the description below uh, to, that'll send you to our Patreon page, which is the gateway to get into our Discord. And then when the website's up, you'll have direct access to the website. Okay. Very exciting. Let's jump right in. Mikey's going to start okay. punching in tickers and we'll come up I with a fair a value. I list from you guys already, right off the chat. So. Yeah, we got a whole bunch already, huh? We're good, good go go for it. Yeah, go good for Adobe. It looks slightly overvalued, although Adobe's one of those companies I'd like to own. It's not on my bucket list, but I got to research it more. But slightly overvalued now. Alibaba. Alibaba. <laughs> this is a stock I do, in fact, own. And we can see, obviously, green is good. They have a high cost of capital, but this stock is generating... By the way, I, I have all of this stuff kicking over to U.S. dollars. So this is $12.1 billion, $19 billion, $27 billion. Uh, They're kicking out a ton of free cash flow. They have only got a 15 price-to-earnings multiple. We added credit rating since the last time we did this for YouTube. 
Uh, if you're curious what the credit ratings, AAA is the best. Uh, so it's it's got a decent credit rating, A plus and S and P. You know, so it's overall it's fairly good. But the stock looks super undervalued. Uh, so this, if you haven't done research on this stock, you might consider deep diving deeper into it. See if it's a company you want to own. Obviously, there are risks, which is why it's trading at such a big discount. But still, that's super cheap considering how big they are and how much money that they're generating. So um, I, I'm a big, I'm a big uh, Alibaba fan. See if you can answer a quick question right off the chat. They want to know where where you find the whack of a company. Usually, WAC uh, can be calculated. Now, we'll have it on the website. We're going to make sure it is, and uh, we're going to get it from, I believe, Morningstar calculates it. But basically, I did a whole video on weighted average cost of capital, and basically, it's the cost of equity and the cost of debt. And let's say half the money they've raised is debt. Well, if they're borrowing money at 3%, that's the cost of debt. If, they're, if their cost of equity is 10%, well, you average those out. It's the weighted average cost of capital. That's what that is. I'll leave a link in the description below. I'll add it after we're done with this live stream for how to calculate WAC. Uh, but it's on our video list if you're curious about it. It's not a very long video, but it's uh, it ex I try to explain it fairly thoroughly. It's okay. a good number to use. 3M. 3M. Okay, so for me, th this is actually a good one. I like 3M. 7.5%, it looks undervalued. 200 were worth 201 um here i mean we're talking 50 couple 50s or so dollar upside now for me the two most important numbers when looking at the fair value are for me seven and a half percent but also the cost of capital i liked I, if both are green if both of these are green to me that looks like a good stock to do deeper research on and 3m by the way their company uh they make a lot of like uh scotch tape they have a whole bunch of they do a lot more than you think yeah, yeah they do a whole they have a whole ton of products that you know are, are fairly reliable and i like the company and it looks like it could be undervalued they've only got a 15 pe so overall this is a company i'm a big fan of i think that we're going to get a lot of good ones coming out today because of the way the uh the market's been down a lot, a lot action, so yeah. yeah, it could be a lot of big opportunities here. So 3M looks pretty good, could be worth diving deeper into. I think this is Tyson Foods? No? Tyson yeah, Foods. Right. Yeah. Okay, again, they have a lower cost of capital. By the way, uh, most, if you're going defensive companies, food companies, uh, if you're going to go actual defense companies like a Lockheed Martin or you know, General Dynamics, something like that, they're usually going to have a lower cost of capital because uh, they tend to be less volatile stocks. So this being lower than my 7.5% is probably a good sign. It looks undervalued there. I would lean on, I'd say, okay, this one's worth 141, which is the more conservative number. Looks like it could be undervalued. So overall, I like this. Again, this could be a very good one especially with the way food prices. I know they've been going, food inflation's been going nuts. Insane. Oh, one other point. I actually want to bring this out real quick. We can't completely rely on this yet because I'm still messing with it. But see this right here? So here's the thing. I have been able to, I have added the percentage of this. This is Tyson class A. That's what that A will represent. There's other classes of stock. Apparently, Tyson Class A only represents 80% of the total company. So 80% of this is actually 113. Now, that works. It might work in this scenario. I haven't researched Tyson uh, to see how they break it up. But real quick, Mikey, can you switch this to Berkshire Hathaway, BRK slash A? We're going to look at Berkshire Hathaway's Class A shares. I'm going to show you an example of where this calculation is not working, which is why I don't want you to lean on it. First of all, it's a bank. Uh, well, it's, a, it's a, essentially an insurance company, which is price to tangible book value would be a better valuation method. According to that, it looks slightly undervalued. But here's the thing. As you can see, their share class is 0.05%. But that's because class A, class B represents, it's like 300 to one or 200 to one or 100 to one, whatever it is, A to B. So it's not... You can't just say, oh, it's only a half of 1% of the entire five, yeah, half of 1%, whatever it is. You can't do that with Berkshire Hathaway. So I wouldn't lean on these numbers too much, but I do have it up there because I want it. I, if you see it there and you're researching the company, dig into it. Be like, I didn't know Tyson had, uh, if you go back to Tyson real quick, uh, I didn't know that Tyson even had other classes of share, other share classes. So now that you see this and now that you see this is here, don't lean on this calculation, but just make a mental note of there's other classes of share.
yeah, other shares out there. So think about <laughs> it. Okay, on to the next company. Sorry for the rant there. This one just ran on the chat's Foot Locker. I know they took a big dive the other day. So. Wow. Okay. So apparently Nike is selling directly to customers. And that's, where and that's, and that's why Foot Locker that's why dropped? dropped yeah. Let's check their stock price. Oh, wow. Look at that. Yeah, big drop there, huh? Uh, so, I mean, it looks way undervalued here. It looks way undervalued here. Even at 10% cost of capital, it looks undervalued. For me, using the cost of capital and 7.5% looks undervalued. This could be one to dig in deeper. I'm not sure why it's uh, why it's so low. You got some analysts here, so I think five going out three years is pretty good. That's a reasonable number of analysts. And this again is this is the average of you know for each year. So this is 481 is the average of these eight analysts. Uh, reasonable growth. They have a big drop here. I'm not sure what you know. One, we were doing our research. We should dig into this to see if there's a. Uh, a value trap you know are they going are they Which is, is, are they losing money is something happening that they're falling off a cliff and they should be cheap so when you do your research check for that if you ever see it looks super undervalued but it is reasonably undervalued that hey this could be this could be a great opportunity all right now keep running off the chat here toyota toyota okay this is the opposite end looks overvalued they got a lower cost of capital lower than my seven and a half percent uh, 6.8 reasonable cost of capital, but yeah, still at 121. I'm at 89. Yeah, to, to me, this just looks, you know, they're coming off a negative free cash flow. You know, we only got one. Okay, so this is important. We only got one analyst going out the next two years. You know, that's uh, how reliable is that analyst? I don't know. I actually don't usually don't like it if there's just one analyst. Sometimes what we can do is we could switch to revenue estimates. Revenue tends to have more analysts and uh Not but even with that more, yeah. oh look at this so what this does is takes the five-year average free cash flow to revenue how much what percentage of revenue is being converted to free cash flow because it's a negative number this isn't even giving us a it's not even giving us a valuation so we might want to try to find a different fair value method or just admit that this thing looks overvalued <laughs> all right moving right along well, the opposite now mt oh m hey well hey might as well stay <laughs> macy's all right uh <laughs> what do you think before I put looks MT. super undervalued uh but this is a good 2.3 billion free cash flow last year big drop this year up a little back down a little to me i'm seeing very limited very limited growth here that would be my number one question i mean it looks undervalued it looks like it could be good just a pe of 5x uh, they got some dividend. It looks 25 to 67, pretty good upside. But are we sure, you know, what about that growth? Do we think our estimates, don't forget, the perpetual growth rate assumes 2.5% on average. It wouldn't be every year. But on average, over the long run, that's where it would be. Do we think that's going to happen? If we don't think that's going to happen, bail out. Uh, so could be worth uh, looking closer at. What I was trying to put in. Uh, okay, I don't know how to... I pronounce that, but I think it's a steel company, if I'm not mistaken, right, Mikey? I believe so. My, Mikey goes through a lot of this stuff. Uh, okay, so they surprised me with some of these, though. <laughs> this is the very 15% is a high cost of capital. That concerns me, but even with that, you're talking pretty close to fair value, 30 to 27. But it makes me a bit more hesitant here. Why their cost of capital is so high? I like when both cost of capital and my seven and a half percent look good. But I just want to point this out real quick. Look at free cash flow estimates expectations got a reasonable number of analysts look at this 6.8 billion 7.7 5 billion 3.2 billion what is going on if you're researching this one that's what i'm looking at it looks like it could be undervalued even at 12 and a half percent this thing looks like it could have some upside but why is that trending lower don't forget we're projecting two and a half percent growth after that oh by the way on the website if you guys want to sign up for this website it's coming in a second quarter of this year if you want to sign up Link in the description below, but on the website, it will give you the ability to change that 2.5%. You might, for this company, say, you know what? I don't think it's going to grow. I think it's going to be zero. And if you did that, fine. You, you, you'll get the fair value calculation based on 0% perpetual growth rate. Perfectly reasonable, but obviously the fair value is going to drop down. So, looks good, but I, I, I want to know why their revenue or free cash flow is expected to drop. Okay. Look into it more. SWBI. 
Smith and Wesson. Smith and Wesson. We're actually doing this company again. We're declining, big declines. No analysts here, so just ignore those errors. That's an that's an Excel thing. I got this whole thing tapped into Excel, and I'm tapping into uh, a few different data sources to pull down this information. Uh, but we can see revenues, or not revenue, free cash flow is expected to decline. So it's got a low PE. It looks super undervalued, 17 to 42, 17 to 53 using their cost of capital. So I think it could be interesting, but I want to know why free cash flow. It always makes me nervous when free cash flow is declining, unless there's a reason. You do the research. You know, a company like Intel is showing free cash flow declining, but I've done the research. I know that's based on higher spending to get growth down the line. Smith & Wesson might be the exact same thing. So something to consider. All right. Next up, we got PayPal. PayPal. Ooh, PayPal looks interesting. 110 to 158. They got a 10.3% cost of capital. So it's slightly overvalued using that. That's a little bit high on the cost of capital side, but I would expect that from a tech stock. Higher than average PE. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering, last time I checked, the S&P 500 had not uh, average PE of about 23X. So 32 is on the high end. Plenty of analysts. You got decent growth. I'm, I'm happy with these numbers. So this 158 is going to be conservative because you're going, you know, even if we took the middle number here and called it 21%, we're dropping right down to two and a half. So you probably get the fair. I mean, this thing might, even with even with the weighted average cost of capital, if we were extending this out 10 years where we were declining gradually, instead of dropping right up a cliff to two and a half, we gradually declined to two and a half percent. Which is a very, it's a very fair for perpetual growth rate, by the way. Usually it'd be somewhere between two and three, maybe a little bit higher, but 2.5 is usually a good, reliable number. Uh, but it's not necessarily reliable to drop off from here down to two and a half. I would prefer to see a linear thing, which is why we're building that into the website. Uh, again, link in the description below. All right, this one might be an investment company. I'm not sure. Yeah. Evercore, Evercore ISI. Okay. This is a perfect example of free cash flow doesn't really work with with financial with a lot of financial companies, insurance companies, banks, uh, diversified financial. I'm not exactly sure. I know Evercore writes investment research. I know that because I've been a research client of theirs. But uh, but what typically what we can use is price to tangible book value. If you're ever looking at a bank, go to price to tangible book value. So here it looks undervalued. This line here is, I believe, the five-year average. And this red line is the five-year average. Right now, it's trading at 4x. The five-year average is 6.3x. So that looks like it could have some upside. Price to tangible book value will work better for Berkshire Hathaway, for companies like this, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, uh, companies like that. Uh, so overall, it looks, uh, yeah, it looks like it could be undervalued. You know, we'll have to come up, we could do the math at some point to, calculate what it should be worth but for now it looks undervalued i like this one to dig deeper on so it finally happened someone asked for wwe <laughs> My, mikey loves this company he's always been looking I mean, at this like, one why is no one requesting this uh okay so somebody asked for this one 58 dollars 117 upside low cost of capital which is impressive so this is a more conservative number whatever one's a higher cost of capital tends to be the more conservative number uh even at 10 percent, the stock should be worth 75 bucks what kind of numbers do we got here? We got reasonable growth. Uh, so you might have, you got a, a decent, okay enough analysts. You know, one, two analysts, I hesitate. Three, you're getting okay. Four, five, six, you're getting up there. Anything above that, you're fine. Uh, but this here, you're seeing a big increase. Look at the capital expenditures. We're seeing a big increase. 39 million up to 232 million, back down to 67. Something is expected in this year. Uh, could be expansion, could be building a plant, could be not building a plant for WWE, but uh, <laughs> could be making an acquisition. It could be a lot of different things. So I would dig into that, what that is. But sometimes that negative free cash flow, you, even if that was negative, that's not necessarily a bad thing. If it bringing, it might ramp up growth in the years after that. It might be why you're getting a decent growth number here. So again, this company looks pretty good. I like this one overall. Although, small point, just notice this. This pops up when we have different share classes. Class A apparently only represents 58% of the total share class. 
Keep that in the back of your mind. If you'd have to look at how their share classes are broken up, does one get voting rights? Does another one, you know, not get voting rights? Are they, you know, is one tied to the other, like Berkshire Hathaway? So don't necessarily lean on this, but as far as the number of shares outstanding, this share class represents 58.46% of the number of shares. That's too long of a decimal. I'm going to get rid of that decimal. 58%. <laughs> it's just rounded. You guys get the point. All right, moving on. Next sure. company. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> All right. Salesforce.com. Salesforce. Ooh. Only slightly overvalued at 7.5%. 197 to 208. This is the real opportunity, I think, as the markets are pulling back. By the way, one thing I haven't mentioned yet, all of these numbers, these calculations are all debt adjusted. This is the debt. This is the cash. Basically, you take the ca the debt, you subtract the cash, you end up with net debt. How much is that per share? That gets taken away. And so this is, assuming they paid off, they took all the cash and paid off all the debt, what is the value after that? So these are all debt adjusted numbers. You don't always have to adjust it for debt. You know, textbooks do it a little bit differently. Textbooks tell you to use cost of capital. You know, they're, they're, they're a bit, you know, more in the weeds. This is a good rough estimate. So the other thing is you can easily look at this and say 197. All right, call it 195. Call it 200 bucks. These are roundabout estimates, which is why you want to add a margin of safety to this. If this thing was trading at 196.50, there's not a shot on buying it. I need it to drop. To, all right, let's just call this about 197 could be 195 could be 200 could you know let me add a margin of safety to that add 10 percent 15 20 percent lower than that is where i'm typically aiming i usually pick my margin of safety based on my confidence in the company a company like microsoft apple very small margin of safety i don't need much salesforce i haven't done the research in a while but i from what i do know of them i would guess you need a larger margin of safety probably in the 10 15 20 percent range but that's just me to each his own on that one <laughs> All right. Um, what else do we got? Okay. Rick. Rick. Rick Hospitality. Is this a REIT? I don't know much about this company. Okay, so you got very few analysts. According to those, you got one analyst. According to that guy or girl, I don't know. Uh, looks like it's under. Uh, looks like it's overvalued according to discounted cash flow. On the PE side, it, it is quite low uh rci hospitality i don't know what they do uh I, I don't know is it like a i asked if it's a read although i'm guessing it's not because something with like restaurants and bars but i'm not quite sure what they do oh okay i i was thinking uh they owned you know hospitality places but well, if restaurants it, and bars are hospitality. that's true yeah <laughs> i was thinking do they own them or do they manage oh, them oh, that's, if they yeah, manage was, them the other thing is that this dive. yeah this dive. company's kind of small 617 million by the way those numbers are all in millions everything 42 million 14 28 million we're getting good growth though so this is on the con more conservative end with our drop off again I, if this was on the website i would extend this out further i would typically stick with three years and then on unusual situations like this extend them out further extend this one out a bit further you might get close to fairly valued right now using discount of free cash flow and a seven and a half percent cost of cap required rate of return so something to think about all right but yeah, it could be worth digging into. It's a low PE. Next up, we have... What is Disney doing? Disney. I love Disney. $79. Really? Really? I wish. $79 fair value. So I own Disney. And I... I I, that's the lowest fair value we've gotten. Yeah, that. I wonder why. There mu this must have dropped. Analysts must be expecting some increase yeah look at this increase you go 3.5 billion in expenses last year to five point this is capital expenditures this is like how much they spend the theory with capital expenditures is it's how much you spend to maintain the business maintain and grow the business so if you were going to build a new plant well that number would go up if you were going to open a new theme park disney there's so many things open a new theme park uh make new movies you know you're gonna you'd have to make a lot of movies to add you know a couple billion to it but still, you know, launch a new platform, Disney Plus. They dropped a whole bunch of money leading up to that. But the theory is that they're doing that to get growth later. Now, given these growth numbers, uh, we're, we obviously this would be conservative. But I'm surprised that this is as low as it is. You know, it's a company I own. I'm perfectly happy to sit on this 
and hold this for a long for the long run. By the way, people have asked me many times. Uh, I just want to clarify one thing. People have asked me many times that, hey, if Disney, let's pretend we believe this is worth 79 bucks a share. I own the shares. I bought them at like 90 something dollars per share. And it's at 147 right now. Why not sell? It's overvalued. And I, this is not a target price. Target price, which is what analysts do, and I don't like them. Uh, target price are typically what you're aiming to get to and then in theory get out. That is not the case. The theory here is if this stock was trading at exactly $79, going out just three years, uh, and perpetual growth rate of 2.5% after that, but if you bought it at 79 in theory, you would return 7.5% per year. So... That's why I like to add a margin of safety because I don't, people always ask me, hey, why don't you use a higher cost of capital? It's because very few companies would actually meet your required, would actually fall into the fair value level if you use, let's say, 12.5% or 15%. Very few companies would ever get there. 7.5, you're going to get some there. You add a margin of safety and it adds a buffer to it. But in this case, we'd have to go out further to see what the true fair value of this would be because this is... Uh, I don't know what happened that that would be as low as it is. Because uh, we checked it out two weeks ago and yeah. it wasn't there. They must have announced, there must have been something. Some, some, so something worth there. researching. Take a look into it. We'll look into it. Google. Google. Uh, this over the L. Which one do we... uh, yeah, do that one. That was fine. Right. Yeah, Google. So this is an example of where the share class does make sense. So Google, if you do discount of cash flow, here's why the share class thing is important. It's actually why we started doing it. These free cash flow estimates are not for their class C shares, right? It is for the entire company. But when you pull up Google, it looks super undervalued. It's 7,000? 7, 7, what was that? No, that would be, uh, yeah, $7 billion. No, it's, yeah, 7,000. Oh. That's actually dollar stock. Yeah, that's a dollar price. Yeah, I'm sorry. The thousands <laughs> threw me off. Uh, these are billions, 96 billion, 113 billion. That's actually $7,000. But... Class C only represents 48% of the, the company. So 48% of that is about 3,300. In this case, Google looks like it could still be undervalued, which is impressive. Now, if we add an L to that one real quick, Mikey, we're going to add an L. I believe this is class A. Yes. Class A represents 46%. Again, 3,300 bucks. Now, the difference between class A and class C, one of the classes get voting rights, the other class doesn't get voting rights. Now, you might look at that and be like, oh, but why is the fair value so close to each other? It is because there's class A, there's class C, both are publicly traded, then there's class B. Class B is owned by the insiders, right? And class B gets all the votes. I think they get 10 share, they get 10 votes for every share that they own. So whether you own class A or class C is somewhat irrelevant. That's why the two trade so close to each other because class B, even though they only own about 10% of the business, they get 100% of the votes because they can dominate everybody's vote. So that's why the market has priced them right near each other. So Google, interestingly, looks undervalued and could be worth a deeper dive. I'd, I should do a deeper dive on that. Uh, cause that's a we company. Do it, do I like the growth. I mean, looks the growth looks great. And these are conservative numbers cause I'm we're old. still dropping right Who's down. Not comfortable with Google right now. Yeah. We're still dropping down to two and a half percent. So these are conservative and it looks undervalued. Palantir technologies, Palantir technologies, software. Don't know much about the company, but very close to fair value. It's slightly overvalued right now. According to this, um, super conservative. We're getting, you know, growth is ramping up and, and our three-year estimates here, again, on the website, we're going to have, you can go up to 10 years. Uh, so we'll get a much better picture of it. But I, I, you could dig deeper on this one. This one, it looks, yes, it looks slightly overvalued on this. But because we know that I would be shocked if a company can grow 25%, 6, 47, 55, up two and a half. Like the odds of that there, maybe they bell curve it and they start heading lower, but they're not dropping down to two and a half. So super conservative. And because of that, conservative might actually be a bit undervalued. Oh, also important to point out, this is just 95% of the share class. Uh, doesn't adjust the fair value too much. Yeah, I got rid of some of the rounding, so... And half the reason, by the way, half the reason I'm, we're rounding all of these is because uh, 
because because these are estimates. They're not. You can't look at this and say, okay, it's worth ten dollars. It's worth about ten. You know, it's worth about ten. I want to pay about nine, about eight, about eight and a half, something like that. Everything's rounded. So don't try not to get too stuck on the individual numbers. Make sure you do the research to see whether or not it's actually a good buy. But overall, this one's close enough. This could be very interesting. Yeah, we use these this software to narrow down our searches which stocks we're looking at exactly which track. ones do we want to do a deep dive on and then we're diving into the ones that look like hey maybe this is fairly valued and then the other thing is be super careful when you're doing the, your own research be super careful that you don't go you don't like get biased that all right you just find the good information about you ignore the bad news you ignore the bad signs the red flags and you jump in because you want to buy it try not to let that happen try to you know Determine your buy spot after you do all the research and see if it's even worth buying. All right, WHR, whatever that is, Whirlpool. So, 7.5% looks way undervalued. 9.3%, a bit more conservative. It's about fairly valued, but we're getting two greens here. So, I mean, overall, this thing looks pretty interesting. 7X, uh, that's interesting. I don't know what's happening there. I mean, you've got capital expenditures are down a little, up a little, not a lot. You're declining from here to here, 1.6 billion to 1 billion. I'd like to know what's happening. You only got one analyst there, so take that for what it's worth. But even here, you're going 16, 1.6 billion to 1.3 billion. I hesitate on this one. This one makes me a little bit nervous uh, just because I want to know their growth and what they're trying to do. Are they, uh, I know this is a very, you know, iconic brand, but are they keeping up with the times? This is, now, if I'm researching it, that's what I'm trying to find out. Okay, next one. So, looks interesting, could be worth diving deeper, but make sure you understand what's happening with the numbers, or why their numbers seem to be falling. Intel. All right, Intel, Intel this is a good example. So, look at this one. I've Obviously, I own Intel, and uh, it's one of the positions I've had to defend the most from the the internets and but here's the thing 20 billion last year up to 27 28 billion 28 billion their numbers obviously uh if we pull up oh i forgot we got these charts here uh free cash flow 2020 they put up what was that number 20 we'll call it 20.9 20 20.9 billion in free cash flow right that is a huge decline down to 68 million but that is because they're building new plants they're putting up like foundries and stuff trying to expand their capability one of the things that has driven their stock lower is has been their some hiccups that they've had inefficiencies call it with their manufacturing of their chips because they manufacture all their own chips so what they're doing is building new plants which drive down free cash flow but i happen to know that this free cash flow number is, uh, I happen to know that that free cash flow number is expected to come back to the 15, 16 billion dollar range in year four. Now, one way around this is this is the advantage of doing the research when you're coming up with a fair value is that when we switch to revenue estimates and we were to say, okay, if they end up in the 15, 16 billion dollar range in year four, about where would we be? I adjusted, uh, I have a different calculator that uh, that I emailed to a whole bunch of people uh, where you can plug in your own numbers and basically do the calculation. So I did my own calculation. I actually got a fair value of $73 per share. We're getting 75 here. And that would make sense because I'm actually extending it one more year where I bring it to, I think I brought it to about 15.5 .5 billion. So assuming what I assume is that they have these numbers followed by 15.5 and then I gradually stair step it down and the fair value looks much more reasonable. So this is an example of when you look super conservative from a growth perspective. Obviously, these growth numbers are outrageous, but these are also reasons, things to dig into from a value perspective that, hey, do we think that the growth numbers are reasonable? In the case of Intel, well, they're spending a ton of money over the short term to get bigger growth later, so we got to calculate for that. When I calculated it, I got a $73 fair value. So, again, take that for what it's worth. That was about two weeks ago. Hey, Jim, we're about halfway through. We've got about 350 viewers right now. Why don't you tell us a little bit about our community? Let us let, let them know when they can get their hands on this tool themselves. Oh, yeah. Okay, so 
we so obviously you guys have seen how we're calculating it again there's a link in the description below to how to sign up for this website the website will be up and running by the end of the second quarter of this year so we're almost at the end of the first quarter by the end of the second quarter version one of this and we plan on continuing to add uh can, real quick can you plug in uh let's say goldman sachs gs i just want to show you uh where we're trying to go with this so goldman sachs it's a financial company it's a bank it doesn't really work fair value discounted cash flow doesn't work because they don't generate free cash flow they it's different for financial companies that's why if you ever see valuation methods a lot of times it doesn't work for financial companies but we are adding in version probably two of our version three of the website we're going to add charts like this that was price to funds from operations that's great for REITs this isn't a REIT so it doesn't work there <laughs> price to book value this is actually price to tangible book value is a great valuation method great for a company like Berkshire Hathaway Goldman Sachs JP Morgan Bank of America Merrill Merrill Lynch that is Bank of America you know what I mean uh <laughs> financial companies insurance companies this would work very well for that companies that have a ton of liquid assets like a bank does this is a better valuation method. We could see in this case, Goldman Sachs looks to be slightly overvalued if we believe that their five-year average is the number to use. So this website will be up and running in uh, by the end of the second quarter. If you want to sign up, link in the description below. And if you do sign up, we're locking in the price that the price will never go up on you. So you come over, you sign up, and that price will never come up in you. In the meantime, we have a Discord, a private Discord that you get access to. Mikey and I do this weekly live stream just like this, but just with the investing community. So way less comments because uh, there's, you know, you're only one of a, you know, however many people that are joining versus YouTube. And uh, so that's a, it's a much, uh, it's a much more tightly knit community over there. So if you want to come over there and join that, you get access to that in the meantime. And yeah, that's it. So come over, sign up, link in the description below. On to the next company. Which is? Which is? Barry. Barry Global, a materials company. Looks undervalued here, looks undervalued here. So they have a lower cost of capital. I'm not 100% sure what Barry Global does, but it looks like a reasonably priced stock. 11 PE. They have like plastic products, I think. Do they? Okay. Uh, Plenty of analysts. You got some growth, very reasonable growth numbers. So this is an example of our 2.5% perpetual growth rate. I have no issue with that. It grew 1.3% here, 4.2, 8.5. Maybe it's slightly higher. Maybe if you extended, you knock up the fair value from 76 to 78 or so. But overall, this seems like a very reasonable fair value. A little bit on the conservative end, but not much at all. So I wouldn't be too concerned. This stock looks interesting. Uh, yeah, I would dive deeper into this one. This one looks good. What else do we got? DBX. Dropbox. Dropbox. Really? That looks <laughs> undervalued. I like Dropbox. I use Dropbox. They got good growth, although that growth is not as high as I would have expected. I, for some reason, was expecting higher growth. 22 PE. It's a bit on the high end. Uh, it's a little less than the market. If assume the market's still at 23. Last I saw it was. Uh, bit on the high end but you know i say on the high end because the average over the market is like 1920 in the 18 19 20 is the long-term average of the market for them their own five-year history is 93x so that looks you know quite good this even works at 12 and a half percent looks like there's some upside here lower cost of capital which is impressive for a tech company like this or a software company like this so overall super interesting although they do have this is class a this is only 78 percent we got to do the math to see if this works. I don't know what their classes mean. We'd have to research that. But overall, stock looks quite interesting. But even if we had used that adjusted fair value, if that is accurate, assuming the classes are, you know, have the same rights, uh, yeah, still looks That's way undervalued. Yeah, that, that one's super interesting. Next up, we've got Hewlett Packard, HP. Okay. You got some analysts. You only got two out here. So call that, you know, take that for what it's worth. Although the growth number there is call it about flat. Numbers declining. We got to dig into why that's happening. From a free cash flow perspective, it looks undervalued. But one thing to note. So I'm actually, 
with uh, something like price to earnings, I think one of the advantages of price to earnings, there's all sorts of disadvantages to it, but one of the advantages is this PE is at 9x. And you say, okay, 9x is low. It is low. It looks cheap. But their own five-year average is 10x. So that would imply to me that this stock tends to trade on the on the lower, on the cheaper end, if you want to call it that. Uh, so is this a reasonable, is $85 a reasonable number to go with? Tough to tell. We'd have to do the research and find out. But overall, I think that the stock looks like it's worth digging into. Uh, you do have, you know, it's about flat, a 5.8 billion to have them going down. That would be the number one question I'd be trying to answer is why is free cash flow trending lower with a stock that, frankly, in today's day and age, should probably be moving higher. Are their products keeping up with the times? I don't know. Okay, moving what on. else we got? Moving right along. Oh, that's it, we did them all. And we've covered all the stocks <laughs> on the planet. Forget the need for the discounted cash flow calculator. Facebook, I own this one. I recently bought it. Where did I buy it? I bought it at 220 something, 222, something like that. So I'm down a little bit. I did a deep dive on this one and you can see that they're getting a big jump in capital expenditures, which is why you see a drop in free cash flow, but then free cash flow is expected to ramp up. Now this stock has taken a beating when I pull it up. It is taking a, a beating recently. That's right after I bought it. I bought it right <laughs> in this area uh, because uh, they basically lowered their growth expectations and lots of people don't like Facebook. So I understand all of that. I actually don't use Facebook myself or not often. And I have it for like business, but I don't really use it for, uh, I don't really use it for, from a Facebook perspective, you know, typical socialing, socializing perspective. I don't really do that. But overall company looks super cheap. It is, there is another class of stock. So just keep that in mind. But even there, stock looks super cheap overall. I really like this company. They got 14 billion in debt, 47 billion in cash. That alone, by the way, that adds to the fair value. So just like the debt would take it away, this one adds to it. Overall, I'm a big fan of the company though. Big fan of the, the cash they generate. Crocs looks undervalued here. That is a huge weighted average cost of capital. That would be the very first thing. If I'm researching this stock, that is the very first thing I want to understand better. Why is that 17.5%? They have a reasonable level of debt, uh, less than a billion dollars, 964 million. Got enough cash. I have no problem with that. Uh, free cash flow is trending higher, so that is good. They're trending in the right direction. But yeah, I don't know. That, that scares me. Beyond that, the stock looks cheap. It's cheap compared to its own history, cheap compared to the market. Uh, I, I want to know why they have such a high cost of capital. Besides that, this one could be worth digging deeper into. This stock could be a great deal right now, assuming we believe that they're going to put up some decent growth like the analysts are projecting. Okay. CRISPR Therapeutics. Pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals. All right. So we've got uh, negative free cash flow. Negative $59. On the website, I have to program it. Uh, I'm going to talk to our developers who, have already, who are already working on it. So that's why I say second quarter of this year. But I have to tell them uh, <laughs> to make sure that I should do it with this website, for with this spreadsheet. Make it zero. Don't. It's not worth negative 59, obviously. Uh, this is a good example of where free cash flow just doesn't work. Why? They're not generating any free cash flow. Or they're actually not projected to generate free cash flow. They did do it last year. Let's check their charts real quick. Okay, so they negative in 2020, positive in 2021. And then analysts, not many analysts. So take that for what it's worth. Are they just negative on them? Or are they are they just down on, you know, the company in general? Or is there something happening that their free cash flow is going to be negative? Expenses don't look like they're expected to ramp up. It looks like analysts are expecting a decline in cash flow from operations, which is good information to have. That's why even if you're not leaning on this fair value, because this is crazy, just ignore the fair <laughs> value. If you, Even if you're not leaning on the fair value, this discounted cash flow doesn't work for this type of company. It's too young. It's too... Uh, it doesn't have positive free cash. You can't use discounted free cash flow. You'd have to go out and project the numbers ourselves, which we'll be able to do on the website. But, uh, but it is interesting to note that their cash flow from operations are trending lower, and I want to know why. Do we agree with them? We could research and analysts can be wrong. 
are are they wrong? Do we think, all right, yeah, maybe it's lower next year or the year after. But after that, I think it's going to ramp up. Or maybe after the three years, like Intel, it ramps down for three or a few years, and then it starts ramping higher. So overall, don't don't be shaken by the negative $59, which is absolutely not accurate. Uh, it's only negative because our numbers are uh, negative free cash flow. Uh, you might not be surprised to hear that you need free cash flow to use <laughs> discount and free cash flow. So first, uh, first requirement. Yeah, for step one, have free cash flow. Okay, now here's actually a perfect example of where the website will be more powerful than this spreadsheet is. They're negative. They're expected to be negative. And then they're expected to go positive. Analysts are expecting them to go positive thanks to a fairly decent ramp up in cash flow from operations. So where the website would be more powerful is we say, okay, let's go out further. Let's go out, let's add our own growth rate. You know, maybe it's a 15% growth rate in 2024. And then we decline it gradually each year for the next, you know, seven years, whatever it is. We go out 10 years total. Then we get a much better look at it. But there's too much negative number here for us to really get anything of value. Uh, we're not going out far enough. So on the website, that will be covered. But this spreadsheet, sadly, I haven't programmed it. One of the reasons is, look at the way the web's, the screen's laid out. I have the limitation of, you know, fitting everything on screen. And I know a big part of our audience watches this on the phone. So we try to make the font at least large enough that you can see it. So I apologize it's not larger, but then we got to cut out information. Okay, sorry, moving along. FF, future fuel, fuel, oh. future fuel, future fuel, no analysts, no analysts. Okay, so we could try revenue they're, estimates. They're coming in the future. Analysts aren't even expecting no analysts there. Uh, so on the website, the way I've programmed the website, not I've programmed it, but the way we're setting up the website with our web developers is right now I'm only using revenue estimates. But what we what we talk to them about is okay. If there are no analyst estimates, which is only happening because this is a $300 million stock, if there are no revenue estimates or analyst estimates for free cash flow or analyst estimates for revenue, go off of historical numbers. Or if there are no historical numbers, let the user, so let you guys, or if I was doing it here, punch in the numbers that we think would be reasonable. You can't do that in the beginning. You got to research the stock first and then punch in the numbers, but I want the calculator to work in any of those scenarios. So... This Excel spreadsheet sadly is not working, but it will once we're up and uh, once the website's up and running. Again, link in the description below to sign up. All right, Mikey, what is what do you got here? He he didn't like my joke. You know, I smiled at him. He wasn't even looking at me. He's looking down at the keyboard. Worth the work, comments. Work 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 work. work, work. Walmart. 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 This is a good example of it works fantastic. Very low cost of capital, which you would expect from a company like Walmart, large blue chip company, very reliable growth. Uh, we're actually expecting a decent amount of growth. These are pretty good growth numbers. I mean, I'm I'm somewhat surprised that their free cash flow growth is as much as it is. But I guess if they keep expanding, you know, sure. Very high credit rating, double A. Triple A is the best. I'm actually surprised they're not a triple A. Uh, low compared to the average, although generally I like, I like for the PE to be below 20, but that's just an internal thing. Somewhat overvalued using 7.5%, but fairly valued using the cost of capital. By the way, on the website, I'm trying to, uh, when I've talked to our web developers, uh, the program, the website programmers, I've been telling them that we're going to make the cost of capital the default number. Because if you ever read a textbook on how to calculate the fair value, cost of capital is usually the number that they suggest, or you can use your own required rate of return. Mine is 7.5%, but it would be insane to assume you guys want to use 7.5% too. So I'm going to make the default number the cost of capital, but then adjust accordingly. If you want to change it, change it. You know, that's change it to whatever you'd like. And then the other numbers here are tied to, so for me, a 7.5%. If this was 8, well, this would add 2.5%, add 2.5, add 2.5. It would just, it's all tied to whatever number you originally chose. So, uh, so yeah, just figured I'd throw that out there. All right, what do we got? Clean Spark, another small company with no analyst estimates. Let's see if there's any revenue estimates. We've got some revenue estimates. Okay, so one thing that we are uh, working on here is... I'm just trying to make a little room. 
one of the tricky parts about this is it takes the five-year average. That's the default, right? It takes the five-year average, but the five-year average is clearly negative, probably because it's a super small company. But hold uh, on, Mikey. Bitcoin mining and energy technology. That's what... Is that what they do? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's why it's small. But let's say we didn't want to do that. And this will be one of the features on the website as well. That negative 220 is there how much free cash flow they generate compared to revenue. So let's change that. I'm just going to go 15%. I just screwed that up. That's not what I meant to do. Let's go 15% now. <laughs> this should change. Okay, yes. Yeah, so what that did was that changed the, each year to be 15%. And that gives us a fair value using their revenue estimates. By the way, you can ignore this. That's because there's no analyst projecting free cash flow. I just didn't program that to get rid of the errors. But... Using If they convert 15% of their revenue into free cash flow, then using these two numbers, you get a fair value of 15 bucks per share. Uh, I didn't program this to work for WAC. I will fix that. We will work on the website, but generally I hesitate in doing this type of thing. Oops, sorry, guys. <laughs> I hesitate for doing that type of thing here on this type of live stream. I just want to show you the capabilities of the website. Only because 15%, where did I get that number? I just made that up. Uh, you know, companies can range. I've seen companies, uh, Microsoft, something like that, be up in the 20, 30, 35% range. I've seen other companies super low, three, four, five, seven percent So you'd have to do the research to see what a fair number would be. But it is, uh, we saw that if you do think, you got to figure out what you think their free cash flow will be and when you think they're going to get, you know, positive. Obviously, analysts are expecting it. But when do we think they're going to get there? Oh. Then we could go... Uh, Leggett and Platt doesn't have... So that okay. that was that finished up that thought. Leggett and Platt doesn't have any analysts? Really? What about using... Okay. So this I'm not totally against. So we can see their five-year average is 8%. Obviously, because we're using five-year average, it's 8.1%. Ten-year average is nine. Three-year average is nine. Last year, they put up three. So 8.1% is probably a reasonable number to use. I'm perfectly okay with that. We got some analysts. These are the amount of analysts projecting revenue because we selected our revenue option here. So using this, we get a fair value of 53 bucks per share. Again, I didn't program my wishing I had now. I didn't program the weighted average cost of capital to work with uh, to work with revenue estimates. I don't know why how I skipped that. But it's also awful close to 10%, 9.6. So that looks slightly overvalued. I'm going to guess this one would be red. So keep that in mind. But overall, uh, yeah, I'm surprised there's no analyst estimates for that. I like the company. I've researched Leggett and Platt in the past, and I like the business. I like the company. I like what they do. I just, you know, I want to buy it at a good price, which is why I don't own it yet. This is the whole point of all this. Exactly. So that's the point. <laughs> yeah. Starbucks, overvalued. This one's simple. High PE, plenty of analysts, good growth. Could argue this is a bit conservative, uh, this whole thing, but even so, overvalued. Yeah. I don't know what else to say about that one. Looks overvalued, yeah. <laughs> Straightforward. Yeah, Sometimes let's they're... jump to the next one. <laughs> Sometimes they just go right at it. Gotta like the layups. <laughs> Apple. Ooh, Apple's one of those. Okay, so this is one of those that I want to own. And their fair value has climbed up a bit. And 164, I don't want to root <laughs> against the stock. I don't want the stock to fall, but I'd love to buy it. So if it fell temporarily, I don't want anybody who owns it to get hurt. But just give us enough time to jump. Yeah, up. I just need I just need a solid 30 <laughs> seconds because I'd love to buy this thing below the 151. Ideally, I'd add a margin of safety to this. But for me, Apple would have like a 5% margin of safety. I did a video on my my bullpen of stocks. And or my, you know, my bucket list of stocks that I want to own when they get to the right price. Apple's on it. Low margin of safety. So is Microsoft. And uh, this kind of cash flow works great for this type of company. So I just like to buy it below our calculation of fair value. I don't even care that the cost of capital is up at 9.4%. By the way, 9%, any single digit cost of capital is not bad. You know, it's a bit on the high end. Anything double digit, I start to be like, all right, what's going on? 9.4, a touch high. But, you know, it that could be a lot of things that's driving it there. We have to look at the calculation for it. All right, on to the next one. 
McDonald's. Mickey D's. Way more overvalued than I would have expected. Discounted cash flow would work well for a stock like this. Reasonable growth numbers. You know, uh, the middle numbers there is 5.8. So you could argue this would be a bit on the more conservative side with our perpetual growth rate. But you got, yeah, you got reasonable growth. You got enough analysts. You got, you're on the high end from a PE perspective. So maybe that confirms that this is in fact a bit overvalued. A reasonable cost of capital, which you would expect for a company, a stock like a company like McDonald's, you would expect them to have a lower cost of capital. 7.8% is certainly reasonable. Uh, yeah, so overall, yeah, it just looks overvalued. I'd wait on this one. Do the research if you'd like. Add it to your bullpen if uh, if you like the company. But I would be waiting for this one to drop. IBM is apparently undervalued and at a low cost of capital. Again, not too surprising. Big company like this. One analyst here, really. Interesting. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Stop messing everything up. Uh, one analyst, uh, but you get... Yeah, reasonable growth, very reasonable growth numbers. Uh, over Low PE, although high compared to their own five-year average. So that's something to consider. We have this PE chart here. If you're curious, this is what the PE was in each day going back the past, apparently, five or so years. Uh, so it's on the high end. It is above the average right now. Uh, so this means, you know, if, if you ever see a chart like this, and eventually we'll have this on the website. Uh, it won't be in the first version, but it'll be in the one of the versions not too long after that. But what this means is that on this day, whatever day this is, you know, on that day, you could have bought IBM for about at a PE of about 8x. Back here, about 12x. Now you're paying 13.5x. So it's really, it's good for from that perspective that compared to its own history, you could have bought it cheaper before. Don't overpay. Unless there's some reason why you would overpay now. Maybe they made an acquisition or there's more growth potential than there was back then. Maybe they did something. So we got to do the research, but looks from a value perspective looks pretty good. But from a PE perspective, maybe it should be undervalued for some reason. Maybe it's a lack of growth. I'm not really sure. I haven't done a re deep dive in IBM in a while. Okay. So far. Is this the bank? Okay. Yes, yes. Discount, uh, discount of free cash flow doesn't really work here. Let's jump to price to tangible book value. Price to book value. None of them are working. Uh, I yeah I question why we're not why we're getting any analysts. So yeah. SoFi Technologies, I I think that's the bank, but it might also be so a stock like it's not working here. Uh, discount of free cash flow is not the correct valuation method, and for some reason, right. but jump over to Visa real quick. All right. Visa is a good example of where it does work. So Visa is yes, it's a financial company. Actually, they're classifying it as a software and services company, but it's a financial company, but their revenue is generated based on transactions. Not it's not like they're a bank and they're loaning money out and taking it in. They have deals with banks, but they're getting paid for transactions. So you're going to, that's why you're going to get analysts projecting free cash flow. In the case of Visa, using seven and a half percent, it looks undervalued using 7.5%. At 9.3%, their own cost of capital, slightly overvalued, so I'd like to see a pullback. Plus, they have multiple shares of stock, so keep that in mind as well. But doesn't really work for SoFi, so... Uh, but I don't, if you're doing your research, I brought up Visa, because if you're doing your research for SoFi, how are they generating money? Is it a transaction-based thing? Might be a combo of the two, and if that's the case, you'd value one of them based on price-to-book value, price-to-tangible book value. Those two are usually pretty close to each other. And then the other section of the business you might value with discounted cash flow. Okay. Okay. AT&T. AT so AT&T's, uh, I own AT&T. I am down in AT&T. Although I'm about close. <laughs> I don't much. know where I bought it. 23, 24, where did I buy it? Either. Yeah, I forget where I bought it. But um, you're getting a fair value of 26. The thing about AT&T, using a cost capital, very low cost capital. Think about AT&T, low PE compared to their own history. Sorry, I keep cutting myself off. Uh, <laughs> the thing about AT&T, and I don't know how analysts are doing this. We could see we have tons of analysts projecting free cash flow. But you could see that free cash flow is trending lower. Now, they had $25 billion last year, and that's trending lower. They're spinning off their Warner Media businesses. One of the their Warner Media business, uh, combining with Discovery, one of the 
concerns that I, one of the reasons I wanted to buy it is because they were spinning that off. I want them to go to their core business. I want them to cut their dividend. They're cutting their dividend. Uh, I want them to cut their dividend because I thought the dividend was too high to begin with, uh, considering the amount of cash that they did. So analyst projections, I assume part of the reason for the decline in analyst projections is they are projecting that, you know, in the future years, they're not going to have the free cash flow that HBO and all that, those platforms, the Warner Media business generates for them. They spun off, I believe, DirecTV already, uh, or they're in the middle of spinning it off. Middle, yep. uh, but so overall, you might get some declining. Declining isn't necessarily bad. You got to do the research because with AT&T, they're spinning it off that, yeah, it's going to decline. You're going to get rid of the, call it the secondary businesses. And then the reason I like the company is that if they can get down to, to their core business, I, I like that business. I think that business has lots of growth and then they'll have a re more reasonable dividend payment right now, 8.83%. That's based off the last 12 months of dividends. It's not going to stay there. It's going down. So keep that in the back of your mind as well. This is Target? Yeah. Target. Okay, low cost of capital looks way undervalued there. More conservative number looks somewhat undervalued at, at 7.5%. Low PE compared to their own history. Plenty of analysts. A decline in free cash flow. Uh, goes up a bit there, but 7.8 billion down to 5.8 billion. I want to know why. Uh, what is happening? CapEx is ramping up. Are they, maybe they're launching new stores. So if, uh, if, Target were to, in there, let's say you read there, you're doing the research and you're reading about what they're doing. If they were to come out and say, hey, we're expanding our stores, right? You're going to get a decline in cap. You're going to get an increase in expenses. And this is going to fall because of that. But then in year four, year five, year six, you could get a ramp up in free cash flow from that point. So uh, Overall, it looks pretty good. The price looks fairly reasonable. PE looks fairly good. I'd be, if I'm researching it, I want to know what do I think is going to happen with, happen with free cash flow over the next decade. Do that research, and this one could be a very good buy. I like this one. This is a good choice. This same uh, Best, Best Buy. buy. Yeah. Okay, Best Buy, 10.4%, which is on the higher end, slightly on the higher end from a cost of capital uh, perspective. 119 bucks per share, so some upside there. 190 at 7.5%, so I'm going with a more conservative number. In my own, when I say I'm going with it, in my own mind, I'm like, all right, what do I think the stock is worth? 190, 119. I'll say 119, be more conservative. Even at 10%, you end up in between those two. That makes sense. Uh, that 10% is in between those two. Uh, plenty of analysts. A drop off in free cash flow, but. Yeah, decline again, up a little. Yeah, so about flat from a free cash flow perspective. So this could be one of those examples that maybe we're being a bit too aggressive. Do we think Best Buy is going to get long-term to our perpetual growth rate of 2.5%? If not, on the website, once you once the website's up and running and you've signed up for it, well, one logical thing to do is to say, all right, let's be conservative and switch this perpetual growth rate to 0%. And just assume they don't grow. They just stay flat. From here on out, what's the stock worth? It's going to be worth something if they're generating, you know, about 2.4 billion every year. Clearly, that's worth something. But what do we think it's worth? The fair value across the board would fall, but by how much? You might get a bit closer to fair value at that point. But the stock looks like it could be undervalued. Got low on the PE end. I dig deeper into this one. All right, we'll do one more. All right, well, what next one? What do we got? United Health. United Health. Way undervalued. Why? All right. So you got some analysts. Look at this ramp up. So we're we're going conservative. So this is interesting because we're going conservative from a free cash flow perspective. Because again, we're growing 75%, 14, 24, two and a half, two and a half, two and a half. Like it's we're going super conservative. Again, on the website, we're gonna have the ability to go a linear decline. All right, go out 10 years and gradually drop from let's say 20 percent down to two and a half that would be a more con uh, less aggressive that would be a less conservative view of this but even with this conservative number look at how undervalued this thing could be even at 10 percent you're getting 620 versus 468 right now a little high on the pe range so i want to know why 
Uh, debt, not the debt's not bad. Fifty billion versus twenty-three billion in cash, twenty-four billion in cash. However, however we want to say it. Uh, yeah, overall this one looks super interesting. I like it. All right, thanks for joining our demonstration today. Sorry if we didn't get to your tickers. We tried to get out to as many yeah. as we could. If you want to get to yours, come over, sign up for the sign website. Up. Link in the description below. We're locking in the price. If you sign up today, we're locking in that price forever. forever. The price will never go up on you. So if you do want to sign up, link in the description below. And uh, and yeah, like I said, the website's going to be even more dynamic than the website than this is right now. So we're going to be able to get to even more tickers. And in future versions, we're going to add the ability to value banks, uh, value REITs. That we're just going to keep adding features to this going forward. So I'm excited about it. Hopefully you come over and join us. If you'd like to, join the Discord. Once you sign up, you'll see they'll send you an email to get into our Discord. We do this weekly live stream. Mikey and I do it every Friday. We're doing it again this Friday. Friday. So far less people on there. So you're not competing with as many people. It's a lot more intimate. And we might even discuss the stocks a little bit further. Yeah. So. All right. Thanks.